begun talking about the situation in Israel, and uh, I finally got it onto a PowerPoint. So, after the long reign of Jeroboam II, some 42 years, he was replaced by his son Zechariah, who only ruled probably actually maybe six months. Um, if you remember, the biblical accounting is if you reign any part of three years, all three years got counted. Uh, so here, this would be uh, if he ruled, that, that should be 752. 752 to 750, uh, 18 months perhaps. Before he was killed by a man named Shalom. Shalom ruled for a grand total of one month. Before he was in turn killed by Menahem. Menahem came to the throne. So in, in a year, in the year 750, you had three kings. And almost certainly, Pekah, who had been an officer for Jeroboam, almost certainly began to rule across the Jordan on the east side. So that you actually had, for all of Menahem's 10 years, Pika was also ruling at the same time. So there was a dual kingship, if you will. Menahem was the one king who was succeeded by his son in these 30 years. And Pekahiah ruled again not more than six months before he was killed by Pika. And Pekah then took over the whole thing <laughs> and ruled for a total of 20 years. At this point, Uzziah, who had been king in Judah, died. Jotham had been his co-regent for probably 15 years uh, because Uzziah, remember, had leprosy and was confined to the palace. So in 539, excuse me, 739, Uzziah died and Jotham became full ruler for about five years. He was pretty clearly forced to take his son Ahaz as a co-regent in 735. And then Hoshea killed Pekah in 730 and took over what was left of the kingdom. And by that point, it was basically the city of Samaria and the immediately surrounding environment. That was about all that was left by that time. And in 722, the Assyrians had had it with him. Uh, he initially it appears was put on the throne by the Egyptian cohort in the government, but almost immediately made an alliance with the Assyrians, and then somewhere toward the end tried to make a new alliance with the Egyptians, and the Assyrians had had it by that point, and they simply took over the whole thing. Now this is going to be especially significant in chapter 7 that we're looking at this evening uh, as God talks about this situation. And he says, you made kings that I never chose, and they have treated you as you deserve. So that's the situation there in the country. And Hezekiah was put on the throne with Ahaz. So you've got from Uzziah down through Hezekiah, you've got at least four co-regencies where again and again the uh, various factions in the government seem to be forcing the sons on the older kings as their 
foreign policy shifted back and forth. Well, those will help us. No, they didn't. Okay, those will help us. No, they didn't. Well, let's do it. So, Hezekiah came to the throne about 726, and Ahaz ruled for another 10 years till 716. So, that's the situation during this time period when Hosea is prophesying. Questions or issues there? Clear enough? Okay. So, we talked a little bit last time about the fact that it's not quite clear where chapter 6 ends and chapter 7 begins. Uh, but, nevertheless, if we begin at chapter 7, verse 1, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed, and the crimes of Samaria reveal. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. But they don't realize that I remember all their evil deeds. <coughs> their sins engulf them. They're always before me. What do the people seem to be thinking? God doesn't see. God doesn't know what's going on. God doesn't see what's happening here. Now, surely anybody who believes in God would know that God knows what's going on. So, what's what's Jose talking about? They didn't really care. They are acting as though God doesn't know. They're acting as though there is no ultimate punishment. They're acting as though there is no God. But that's a very, very foolish position to take. <laughs> Perhaps you remember Blaise Pascal's wager. He said, if you bet that there is no God and lose your bet, you're in eternal trouble. If you bet there is a God and it turns out there is none, you've lost nothing. You better bet there is a God. <laughs> if it comes down simply to that, if it simply comes down to that, then you're on safer ground if you assume there's a God. But these people are assuming that if there is a God, he doesn't know, doesn't care, isn't able to do anything about it. But notice what it says. God, verse 2, I remember all their evil deeds. Why remember? Why not I know? What do you think? All right, bring it back on them. He's willing to forgive if we repent. He's willing to forgive if we repent, if we remember. Okay? Okay. Anything else? <coughs> okay, he remembers <coughs> all of their sins from the very time when he called them out as a nation. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a difference between remembering and just knowing. There's a difference between remembering and just knowing. You're right. What is it? <laughs> There's a heart or a, it's a deeper, uh, yeah, a, a remembrance is more significant. Than it's just, more significant than knowing just knowing. Yes, yes. It's implied engagement. It's like mm -hmm. you're remembering something, you're engaging with you. Okay, you're, correct. you're, you're engaging. Knowing may only be the 
present, but remembering covers the whole waterfront. Knowing is at this moment, but remembering, as we said, is involving yourself at a deeper level. It's a deeper engagement with what's going on. As Linda has said, all the way from the past. So it, it, it suggests a more personal involvement of God with what is taking place here. I remember those things. I take them to heart. I think about them. I imagine. So you may act as if there is no God, as if what you're doing is of no importance. But God takes it all to heart. God remembers it. And we were talking today in the, in the conference about our situation today when people have very little consciousness of sin. How do you talk to people today who, like these people, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows. How do we talk to them? Okay, their conscience is seared, they don't care, so what do we do? An expression of hope when we meet them? Talk about his love. Talk about his love. I think we have to ask them, has anyone you love ever hurt you? Has anyone you love ever hurt you? Share your own testimony. Sometimes I ask, um, what do you do with the wrong you've done? What do you do with the wrong you've done? show how things do matter as opposed to their nihilism. Uh, the suggestion was made by Bill Pierce that today the great problems are alienation, loneliness, depression, and that there is a way, and, and uh, what Carol has suggested I think relates to this as well, that if we can come at them through those kinds of things, then we can begin to talk about issues of sin. And, and has anybody ever hurt you? Has anybody ever done wrong to you? And probably you'll get a waterfall there. And then the possibility, and how about it? Have you ever done wrong to anyone? But this is the situation. They are, as today, saying, who knows who cares? It doesn't really matter what I do. And God says, oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And uh, uh, what we are seeing is, uh, I'm afraid, the beginning of uh, something even more difficult and hard for us to deal with. Notice how that second verse ends. Their sins engulf them. They are always before them. Oh my God. A culture in which sin engulfs. <clears throat> so, the challenge for us is, number one, what about my sins? Is there any way in which I might be included in this bunch? Any way in which I am acting as though there are things God doesn't know about or care about? 
So judgment begins with the house of God. That's what the Bible says. So that's the place where we need to be. Okay. Verses 3 through 7. They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dough till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the princes become inflamed with wine. He joins hands with the mockers. Their hearts are like an oven. They approach him with intrigue. Their passion smolders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fall. None of them falls on <coughs> Now what's the image we're here? What's the repeated image? Heat. An oven that is overheated. The stones are almost red hot. Fire. Now what's the what's the significance of that imagery in this context? Passion. Passion? And we're talking about Israel themselves. They were on fire, but their lust and their passion was about idols. And it was it was misdirected. And they still went about their rituals and their ceremonies, but it was their heart wasn't like it. Exactly. It yes. was just it wasn't about a covenant God. Right. There's there's passion, but it's misdirected passion. Mm -hmm. Destruction. And do you notice in the context of what? What's it say? Right in, in verse three. Entertainment. Entertainment. Yes. Yes. With, with whom? With with the king, yes, yes. There is a political passion. Does that sound at all familiar? <laughs> They're hot. Hot enough to kill people. Without, without the, if you will, gyroscope of the love of God. You know, a gyroscope, uh, once you get that wheel spinning, it's going to keep its position no matter what. And the love of God, the love of God's ways, the love of God's truth, the love of God's law can be a gyroscope. And all around us is fire and flame and passion. They have no gyroscope. Burning like an oven. And what about the kings? What about them? What's their attitude according to these verses? Party's about them. Mm -hmm. The party is about them. What else? They're drunkards. They're drunkards. Mm -hmm. Perverted leadership. They're perverted leadership. They do their own thing. What about that that opening line in verse three? They delight in the wickedness of their people. Why would that be? Why would a king be delighted that his people are wicked? Okay, because he's wicked. They're distracted and entertained. They're distracted and entertained. Okay, okay. They can be. He can be. He can manipulate them because of their wickedness. <laughs> They're no worse than he is. They're content. So 
had people in the go against the authority. Mm -hmm. When they did take the <coughs> underneath, then they rebelled. But they're content. I think the state of pride, the pride that their they decided was going to be their their road to follow. They were doing it, and that's why he was happy. Yeah, I think it's leverage. He has leverage for those people who are wicked. Yeah. He used against them. Like yeah. Me. yeah. He can use their wickedness against them. Leverage. None of them that can judge him. Exactly. Yeah. The context of Hosea in Romans 132 is different. Well, I think the principle is the same. And Romans 132 says, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They do not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So there's this mutual mm -hmm. reinforcement mm -hmm. between the king mm -hmm. and the people. Mm -hmm. If the people were adhering to the covenant, they would be in a position to demand that the king adhere to the covenant. Oh yeah. So that would not be good. But if they are deeply admired in wickedness, then they're going to be in no position to challenge his perversion of leadership. Okay, a byproduct of chapter 4, where the priests were not teaching the covenant. Mm -hmm. And so now, where are we? We're in this kind of a situation. <clears throat> now it's possible, as I commented in the background, that number five, verse 5, maybe this festival of our king, maybe they are delighting over the murder of somebody. They're having a party because, well, we got rid of that guy. <laughs> again, again, this tragedy when ethics and religion are separated from one another. I, I I think again and again about our situation here. How many policemen does it take to enforce the law when the people have finally come to the place where they do not have an inner inclination to obey the law? There are not enough. There are not enough. There can never be enough. Uh, it, it, as you have heard, uh, several of the big companies are pulling out of New York and San Francisco and a couple of other places because of the uncontrollable theft. Really? Um, Home Depot last year lost a billion dollars through theft. There was one chain that was working with people inside, with people outside, and a pastor made one million dollars last year by selling stolen Home Depot tomb tools on eBay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> up the ante. 
if this gives me a thrill, how about that? And if that gives me a thrill, how about this? So that, that theft by itself is not enough. You've got to steal more. So he's describing a situation that is, I think, frighteningly like the one which we are increasingly facing. And the question is, will I be caught up in the maelstrom? Or will I, will we, will we, nurture our relationship with the covenant God so that we have whatever is going on around us, that gyroscope that enables us to stand when everything else is a cesspool of lies here it is I don't care what I don't care whether there's a policeman around. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I love Jesus. God remembers their sin. They've forgotten God. So, look at verse 7. They devour their rulers, all their kings fall. None of them calls on me. What is it about this situation that makes it really dangerous to be a ruler in that situation? Displease them in any way, you're out. Yeah. If we don't believe in God, what do we expect of our rulers? We believe them to be God. We expect them to provide for us what only God can provide. And they will necessarily fail. So what do you do then? Kick the bums out. Again, I'm, I'm more political than I like to be this evening, but I, I see, I see this in America. Oh, Trump didn't do it. Biden will. Biden can't do it. Somebody else will. Maybe Trump. We expect these human beings to be Messiah. And they cannot be. They cannot be. They will necessarily fail. Well, oh, this one will do it. Oh, he didn't do it. Kill him. This one will do it. Kill him. Ah, this one's going to do it. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour their rulers. All their kings fall. And none of them calls on me. Is there none of the kings or none of the people? I think both. <laughs> I think both. Uh, uh, none of them from top to bottom. And you see, if we know that our lives are in God's hands, we can allow people to fail. We can allow people to experiment with possibility. That's what Joseph knew. It, it's so fascinating to me the way the book of Genesis ends. Jacob has died. And the brothers say, oh man, we're in for it now. Mm -hmm. Old Joe, 
Yeah, and he treated us good while the old man was alive. The old man's gone now. You know what he's going to do to us? What are we going to do? Oh, let's concoct a lie and tell Joe that before Dad died, he specifically asked Joe to be good to us. <laughs> and Joseph saw straight through it and started crying. You thought I was that kind of guy, didn't you? You thought I was a guy who was ruled by a need to revenge myself on you. No, I don't need to get revenge. Why did he not hate his brothers? Because he knew his life was never in their control. He knew that his life was in God's hands. So he didn't have to hate them. Wow, that's freedom. That's freedom. So we don't have to expect a president to be superhuman. Good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we do, we're going to be disappointed. And we are. <clears throat> or we have to lie about him and say, well, he really didn't fail. Oh, you people think he did, but he didn't. raises up kingdoms and tears them down, but he's still in control no matter what. Yes. But they've forgotten that. They're not calling on God. They're not trusting. So then, <coughs> verse 8. Faced with that political crisis, what do they do? Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf not turned over. <laughs> Half baked. Half baked. Burned on one side, doughy on the other. <laughs> Foreigners sap his strength, but he doesn't realize it. His hair is sprinkled with gray. That's interesting, isn't it? But he doesn't know it. Israel's arrogance testifies against him. Despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Hmm. What ropes? Could you could you like pull this language for reminding me of judges? Judges thought they they need the king. That's what they need. They need the declaration to have a king, right? But then you talked about in judges. They thought God had got answered even before they had a king. And they said, well, we're very good. <coughs> and then this is like you see in verse 7, like this is a, like the pinnacle of coming a key, king is the answer. Because you have these kings, and like you're all going to hell, basically. So, but, but then you, you see him pointing like there's something more. Judges at the, is at the beginning of the process. This is at the end. And this is 800 years later. Mm -hmm. Now you've got what you asked. It's taken 800 years to really come to that place, but here it is. Yes. So, what are they doing? The, the kings have failed them. So, what are they doing? Aligning with the foreign, aligning themselves with the foreign nations. Exactly. For support. Yes. Yes. Okay. If the kings can't do it then foreign nations can do it for us. And what are the king foreign nations doing? Slowly taking over. They're taking all their money. <laughs> yeah, we'll make a deal with you. Give us all your money. 
Now, what's what's going on in verse nine? What is the their hair is sprinkled with gray? What is that? I mean, I don't like people talking about old people like that. <laughs> it's a gradual it's process. It's a. Uh, like a man in a midlife crisis, he's going down, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> Your formerly stalwart frame is being brought down by old age. Yep. I like the uh, furniture disease. His chest has fallen into his drawers. <laughs> <laughs> contribute to that, do you think? Maybe that they thought that they could breathe new life into them. I think you're right. I think it's, okay, yeah, we'll make a deal with Egypt, and I'll be young and strong again. And in fact, he says, no, what Egypt will do to you will sap out the last bit of your youthful strength, and you won't know what's happening. Go into new life, they get the wrong source of strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to increase my strength, and I'll go not to God, I'll go to Egypt or Assyria or, or, or. I think it's very interesting that George Washington said, Be careful of entangling yourself in foreign alliance. I just, I, oh, when I see that, I always wonder, how long have you been reading Hosea? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Israel trying to make alliance with the Arabs. <laughs> yeah. When you think about what Egypt meant to Israel, yes. yeah. and they're, they're going to eat, yeah. like, how far will they go to avoid going to God? They're going to Egypt, which is like the <laughs> pinnacle of the suffering of their people. It's like yes. the, the great example of their, yes. their long yes. suffering. Yes. The last place you want to go. Mm -hmm. but where else are you going to go? I mean, Assyria is taking everybody else. Egypt is all that's left, so we've got to go to Egypt. And, and Isaiah, uh, in chapters 28 to 33, just mocks this. Just mocks it. Uh, he says, you know, Pharaoh is flesh. His horses are flesh. What's he going to do for you? God is a spirit. What's the matter with your heads? <coughs> you don't get it. And so, here it is again. But, but, when you have ruled out God, the alternatives, as terrible as they really are, begin to look pretty good. But, God? <laughs> well, Isaiah, Hosea, and these guys are contemporary. You want us to just trust God when Assyria is about to eat us alive? You want us just to trust God? You've got to be kidding me. It's like we bury our past, even if it has victory. You no, know, that was back then. You know, we've got to come up with something different. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But. But I think we've got to think about this in our own situation. It's very, very easy to make God the last resort.
is to make all our plans, figure out all our ways of taking care of ourselves, and finally, when those don't work, then maybe turn it to God, or maybe it'll be too late. But if you're not taught about God, then you got nothing else. You got no nowhere to go. Yes. Yes. If the priests had failed you in their teaching mission, what's left? Yes. All right. Verses ten and following, all the way to the end of the chapter. There's something they do not do. Do you see it? They don't turn to God. He does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. That's verse 10. Verse 14, they do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail on their bed. Mm -hmm. The bottom part of verse, or the last part of verse 14, stated positively, they turn away from me. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, they do not turn to the most high. Remember, remember, that the word, the Hebrew word is shub, which means to turn around. That also then is very commonly in English translated. I have chosen my way, and I'm going to go that way, even if it kills me. I'm going to go that way, even if it saps my strength. And God is saying, God is saying, for heaven's sake, turn around. Turn around. And go back toward the true source of your strength end of your life. If that's God, we'll uh, <laughs> They did not call on the Lord, yeah. <laughs> but, but four times, three negative and one one positive, they did not Why not? They don't want to. Why don't they want to? They enjoy their sin. They enjoy their sin? Mm -hmm. I guess um, they didn't know. Yeah. All right, all right. They don't not even, it, it's not even a live option in their mm. thinking. Verse 11 in the New Living says, people of Israel could become like silly witless doves. It, they, they've got no sense. They, they just are kind of flitting around from whatever to whatever. With their, They've lost all of their moorings, all of the anchor yes. that yes. they had when they came out of Egypt. Yes. It's like yes. that history just it escaped know. them. Something else smarter than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, look at verse 12. What's God going to do? Throw a net over them. <laughs> Bring them down. And Why is punish he them. Why going to do that? It, it, it isn't said here, but it's said elsewhere in the book. Why is he going to do that? Because he loved them. Because he loved them. Because he wants to somehow bring them back to himself. Somehow bring them to their senses. I think that probably would need a brain transplant. Mm -hmm. But 
as, as, as I've said before, as we've seen in the book, as we're going to see in the book more, the exile, the terrible thing that they are doing everything in their power to avoid, that's the thing that's going to bring them back to God. And again, that's what's going on in Isaiah. Isaiah, I need somebody to go for me. I'll do it. I'll do it. What do you want me to say? What I want you to say is going to harden this generation's heart. How long? Till the nation is a field of burned out But out of one of those stumps will come a little green shoot. Are you willing to be that faithful, Isaiah? No, I want to be the next Billy Graham. <laughs> no, I want to build a mega church. Not with this bunch you build. Any mega church you build with this bunch. a bunch of silly ducks. They're when they're missing. Mm. You don't say that very loudly in a theological center. <laughs> Woe to them, this is verse 13, because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they've rebelled against me. Again, you people are, are really glutton for punishment. You keep coming back, and I keep saying the same things over and over again. But repetition is the soul of education. Woe to them. I'm going to get them. Destruction to them, because they've rebelled against me. you step in front of a speeding 18-wheeler, it's not going to go down well for you. <laughs> the world is so made that if we live in defiance of the Creator, it's going to hurt. We have to keep fixing that in our heads. Well, the Old Testament, God's always beaten up like well, what he's telling them is, unless you turn to me, it's going to hurt. But this is not an arbitrary tyrant who says, destruction to them because they've rebelled against me. This is not personal pique. This is the creator saying, you were made to walk with me. You were made to walk in certain ways. You don't walk in those ways. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. America, America, it's not going to work. I long to redeem them. Now, I want to ask you about this next phrase. I'm in verse 13. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. What are they saying? Uh, what are they saying? God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. God doesn't hear me. God doesn't care. He's forgotten me. He's forgotten me. He doesn't provide. He just wants to punish. He has abandoned me. He doesn't see me. He doesn't see me. He isn't there. He isn't there. What God? What else are they saying that's false? He can't resolve the situation. He can't resolve the situation? He can't protect me from Assyria, you dummy. Mm 
gave them, I don't need it. I can handle it myself. I can handle it. He's not big enough to handle my problems. He's not big enough to handle my problems. Sounds to me like you folks have been saying those things. <laughs> I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> I heard somebody else, yeah. <laughs> I long to redeem them, but I can't. Because their whole narrative is false. They don't cry out to me from their hearts, but wail on their beds. Oh my. Oh my. I think of this generation of kids who are killing themselves in droves. Full of depression. Psychologists say this is the highest level of anxiety that they have ever known. They don't cry out to you from their bed. Because they don't even know who you are. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine. As I said before, in the fall, the vegetation god dies, goes down into the underworld. And the question is, is he going to come back? <coughs> well, not unless you give him a good funeral. I mean, you've got to do a real wake here. And wakes have a long, long history. <clears throat> About 3,000 years long. Mourn for your dead grandpa by getting roaring drunk. So, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Mr. You have died. And I, I just, we really need for you to come back. And, and see how really sorry we are? Because you, gods, are the suppliers of my needs. <clears throat> but they turn away from you. Why? Well, because you can't manipulate God. You can't make him supply it by doing a nice ritual. All you can do is surrender to him and trust that he's going to do it. Oh, man. <laughs> There's got to be another way than that. I train them and strengthen their arm that they're now slashing. But they turn away from me. They plot evil against me. Good question. <laughs> I think, I think what it is, is th this, what we were talking about above, talking about me falsely. They, they say all these long things about me. Uh, well, you know, uh, Baal, Baal, he, he, he really, works about 51% of the time. Yahweh, you never know whether you're going to work or not. I think it's that sort of thing that they have. Could it also be against his messengers, God's messengers? Why are you going against God's messengers? Yes, yes. Shut up the prophets who say bad things about us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other thoughts there? That's, how do they plot against God? They want to 
they want to discourage all the Christians and all the Jews, anybody that believes in God at all, other, other than God. Or we have not yet not believe in God, other than their God. She's suggesting Hezbollah is probably against <laughs> God. I was just reading that article that says that they want to destroy all, all the Jews and all the Christians in this area of the world. They want to take over the world. That's what she said. Yes. Part of the thing in Israel is in, in the Quran, once Allah has possessed a land, it is his forever. Well, Allah possessed the land of Israel for about 1,300 years. So the Jews are trespassing. I, I smile a bit ruefully when I see people say, oh, we need to pray for peace between Hamas and Israel. That's like praying for peace between the Warsaw Ghetto and Himmler. Well, you remember who Himmler was? Yes. The head of the SS. Oh, and their whole purpose was to destroy the Jews. So let's make peace, huh? <laughs> Don't think that'll work. Okay, anyway. Verse 16. They do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words and then this last verse. They will be ridiculed in the land of All the money you shelled out for the Egyptian alliance for Shia. And then the end they'll just laugh at you. He suggests maybe the Egyptians still remember the plague. <laughs> okay. Pretty bleak chapter. <laughs> Yes. Look at the mapping out. Yes. The lessons are, I think, the lessons are <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Straighten me out. I love the story that uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Wesley Biblical Seminary told he was teaching at a community college. He had eight older women in his class on the history of philosophy. Uh, these were lay women. He finally got done talking about Plato. And one of them said, uh, Professor, was this man Plato married or anything like that? <laughs> and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I don't believe he was. Why do you ask? I think a good woman would have straightened him out. <laughs> so, any, any good women here want to straighten me out? <laughs> Karen? Karen has stepped out. <laughs> 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 All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we in this room turn to you. You are our hope. You are our future. You are our joy. As we began, we are his, and he is ours. We are yours, and you are ours. If there is, in any of our lives, in my life, hidden sin, then reveal it, and help us, help me, to declare it to you, and turn from it. Help us, O oh Lord, on the one hand, not to avoid the political process, 
because of all its difficulties. On the other hand, deliver us from believing that the political process can ultimately solve our problems. Help us, Lord. Help us to be good citizens. Help us to be men and women who joyfully obey the law, whether anybody else does or not, but as a way of expressing our love for you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.